so now the downloads are, you know, well over 5,000 a month. So it just mm. really kind of took off. And, um, you know, again, not to go too down, far down the rabbit hole, but, um, you know, the stages of growth were moving really from the one-to-one -one mm -hmm. way of doing business and creating income to going to the one from one to one to the one to many. Mm -hmm. And so with, with podcasting, there's a lot of opportunity to, to um, monetize the podcast and then also um, create other sidelines that are with that. So I created, you know, as I mentioned, the Google Workspace for Therapists course. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the Scaling Therapy Practice. This is your host, James Myerland. In this episode, we talk to Gordon Brewer from the Practice of Therapy, and he's going to talk about how he's grown his business and scaled his business, generated more revenue by adding things, by adding a podcast, by adding courses, by adding uh, a newsletter and email list, and just how over time being diligent, being um, predictable and being dedicated to his content and to the people that he's serving, that he's grown to a podcast that gets over 5,000 downloads a week, which is uh, quite an accomplishment. Gordon's also just a genuine person. He helps people. He cares about the, the industry and his fellow coworkers. And that's going to come out in this episode. So join me for this episode where we learn from Gordon about how he's grown and scaled his practice. Welcome to the Scaling Therapy Practice. This is James Marland. I am so glad that you joined us. I'm here today with a special guest, Gordon Brewer from the Practice of Therapy. Hello, Gordon. Hi, James. Uh, probably a lot of people know you, but why don't you give yourself uh, an introduction? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, James. I'm real excited uh, about this and and uh, the fact that you've got this podcast because I think it's it's a much needed topic. Well, thank um, you for the folks that yeah. So for folks that might not know me, I'm Gordon Brewer. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm have a private practice in Kingsport, Tennessee. Um, which is the northeast corner of Tennessee, um, Kingsport Counseling Associates. It's a small group practice. Um, when I say small, I usually think of a practice that has 10 or less clinicians as being mm -hmm. more on the small side. But anyway, um, I've got that. I've been, been in private practice for, oh gosh, since 2006 or so, uh, the group practice since 2014. But also I have a podcast that... Um, is part of the Sightcraft Network, along with James, called the Practice of Therapy podcast, and um, been doing that since 2017, and really just um, work on topics. Uh, there on that podcast, we just delve into topics around you know what it takes to run a private practice, both on the clinical side and the business side of things, and just sharing all of that with folks. Um, yeah, and so. Uh, I've, um, um, one of the other hats that I wear is, uh, I'm also a clergy person in the, mm. in the Episcopal church. Um, and, um, yeah. And so I, with the practice of therapy, in addition to the podcast, I've got, uh, a few courses out there with it. One being Google workspace for therapists, another one called money matters for private practice. And then, um, here just to, to put in a little plug here and also some motivation is uh, going to be releasing a course on how to do podcasting in the mental health, <laughs> in mental health context. So I've got I that. I know about that one. Yes. James knows about that one. So that's one of going to be one of our collaborations. That's but, exciting. Uh, yes, it is. It is. And so, uh, yeah, and I'm married, um, have one daughter who is adulting now. She's a, uh, She's a, um, she's a, a environmental educator. She works for a place called the Wahatchee Forest School down in Chattanooga. And she teaches first graders and kindergartners about nature and all of that kind of stuff. And she's outside with them every day, raise or shine. Really? 
Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Was she always into that? Was she always into like nature and teaching? Well, she, well, she was an environmental, environmental and sustainability major in college. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she went to the university of South and also known as Swanee. Um, And uh, she just kind of happened into that. She's a, She's, as I like to tease her about, she's kind of a camp kid rat. She spent most of her summers do, doing uh, church camp stuff, and and it just yeah. uh, absolutely formed her. And so she's still doing that vicariously through those kids. Can't I, I was a camp counselor for, well, I think it was only one season, mm-hmm. and it was like the best, I don't know, it was the best experience of my life. I still have some great, really great memories from that. So she turned it into a career. Right, right. That's cool. Well, she's so, she's having a ball. Yeah. So we met uh, in one of the conferences in Colorado. Like uh, mm-hmm. I'd known you from afar, you know, your podcast mm-hmm. and and whatnot. And we went to um, uh, Killing It Camp. Uh, the first mm-hmm. one, actually, the first Killing It mm-hmm. Camp. And you... Um, you know, sometimes you're not sure, like, what are people like when they're real, <laughs> but you're mm-hmm. a genuine, like, what you see is what you get. Like, mm-hmm. you're a genuine, kind uh, person that's trying to help people. And I remember just sitting, um, I think it, we were, I think everybody had gone and we just sat and talked about, like, hot sauce and whiskey or something like yeah my, does that sound like you uh, yeah yeah or or cigars and whiskey yeah cigars and whiskey were, maybe it yeah, wasn't hot sauce it was just yeah uh, yeah just uh was, different just just some interests and uh that you were um an early part of your career you were were you a mortician yes i was a funeral director for funeral like director 18, that's what they're called yeah, yeah. More, and a mortician too i was a uh, licensed to do both uh embalming and funeral directing and so i did that for like 18 years and so um <laughs> what well, lots, is of, lots of stories background. around that yeah <laughs> but but you were just real and genuine and we sat around and chatted uh you took my picture in front of the uh the the i think mean, what mountains are out in colorado i don't the rockies rocky yeah. mountains uh-huh. there uh it was uh it was a great time and mm-hmm. uh that and it's been a few years since then, but you've just been a great friend and just somebody who gives back to the community. So I'm really happy that you're on the show today. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. Well, yeah. My pleasure. And thanks for your kind words. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's all true. So, uh, so um, let's talk about our tool tip or tech of the week. I'll go first. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're on the video podcast, I have the, I have this book I'm showing up at uh, go put your strengths to work by Marcus Buckingham. And one of, uh, it, it's a wonderful uh, book about using what you're good at to uh, do more. Like, don't try to make up for your weaknesses and like put all your energy into your weaknesses. It's like, focus on your strengths. What are you good at? What is the, what's the, the, the 80 per the 20 percent that you can get do better than anyone else that you get 80 percent more value out of it or whatever the ratios are i'm sure they're mm-hmm. in the book it's been yeah. a few years since i read it but one of the tools i remember from that that i did for a while is in the in the book there's some red and you can see on the video there's some green cards and some red cards and the green cards you would go through your week and write down the things that really made you feel strong the things that were that energized you and like you kind of lost your time you lost time in like you lost like what Mm -hmm. was going on and you wrote down what those things were and then you know uh on the other side you had the red cards what were the things that drained you what were the things that like suck the joy out of your week or life right and and write those down. And then there, there was an exercise in the book, and I don't quite remember it right now, but it was basically evaluate those things and rank rank what you're good at and and try to maximize those things. And over time, try to make your job description just those things that you can benefit from and delegate or delete the, the red cards as much as you're able to. And mm-hmm. so maybe as somebody who's trying to scale their business, you're like, why can't I, why can't I generate some momentum? Well, you might be 
not maximizing your strengths. You might be trying to do everything. And uh, just that was one of a great lesson for me. Like you're, you, you're going to produce the most when you work in your strengths. Right. Right. One, one, I think um, that ratio you're talking about, if I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's something like <laughs> it's actually only 20% of what we do accomplishes 80% of what oh, we right. want to yes. accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. So figuring out that 20% that's really going to move the needle forward. And it's usually like you, like you, like the, the book you, you said alludes to is that, that really we do our best work when we are focusing on the things that number one energize us mm. and that we enjoy doing versus doing those things that are just kind of drudgery for us and that we probably don't do well. I mean, in, in the context of uh, a little, little quick, quick kind of um, anecdote to that, um, James, that I think about is that um, one of the things that uh, early on in my career, I worked for in my counseling career, I, I worked for a nonprofit where we mainly worked with at-risk children and youth mm. and mm -hmm. learned, learned a whole lot from that job. And, uh, I wouldn't give it away for anything that that experience that I gained there. But one of the things I figured out is that I really don't like working with children all that much. Right. And, and yep. I remember, I remember uh, again, we, we talked about my daughter. Uh, my, my daughter always said that I sucked at playing Barbies when we, when she was little. <laughs> so, you know, I just don't have a natural knack <laughs> for connecting with children and doing the play sure. stuff and the imagination stuff. But um yeah. And so I think you really have to find what it is that you really enjoy doing and, and, it, and it energizes you. And that also speaks to just on the clinical side with therapists. If you know what that is, what kinds of clients you enjoy working with mm -hmm. and what energizes you, there's your niche right there. Yeah. And so if sure. you can come up with an avatar of what that ideal client is, that's, that's what, um, where you need to focus. Yeah, who's your who's your dream client? Who's the one that you can connect with the most, mm -hmm. give them the benefit the quickest and that you can can win with. Like those right. are the people that that make you want to keep coming back. It's mm -hmm. it's the, the other ones that make your your life right. tough. Yeah, so. if you think about your caseload um Yeah. And the people that when you look at your schedule that day, you think, oh, no, you know, <laughs> those, uh, uh, that's those a red your, card. That's, yeah, those are your red, red card, card clients. Yeah, your red card you know, clients. <laughs> there's people that you love to take their calls from because you, you just take their calls. And then there's other people you see their number show up and you're just like, oh, not, not again. Like they're the mm -hmm. drainers. That's mm -hmm. that maybe that's a maybe that's a way to adapt that uh, the go put your strengths to work thing is mm -hmm. use red privately, <laughs> mm -hmm. use right. red and green cards or just a check, you know, a check mm -hmm. system for who are your preferred clients and try to maximize that. That's a great that's a great uh, angle for mm -hmm. for therapists. So yeah. uh, great. Well, what's your uh, tool or tip or tech of the week? Yeah, so. Um, folks that have known me or whatever know that I, I love using Google Workspace. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the things that um, really kind of the, the thing that I love about Google Workspace is it's so versatile. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are there are some there are some people, quite a few people, as a matter of fact, I've, when I created the course Google Workspace for Therapists, um, a few years later, I thought, well, I'm going to start a Facebook group. Well, that uh, the Facebook group, I kind of started probably around 2019, something like that. And um, then COVID hit and that group just exploded. And there's right. like over 9,000 members in that Facebook group now um, just sharing tips on how they're using Google Workspace and, um, you know, how they're using them in their practice and so Google Workspace, if you're not familiar with that, if you have a Google account, there's a whole set of tools that you have availability to in the background. So like Google Docs, Google Sheets, um, Google Drive, Google Forms, 
uh, just to name a few. There's uh, another application that I love. It's called Google Keep, which is kind of like a, a light version of something like Evernote or OneNote uh, uh, and that sort of thing. But one of the things about it, and then of course, Gmail um, is another big one. And how I kind of stumbled upon Google Workspace was I was, when I was getting my practice going and particularly when I started my group practice, I wanted to have my um, website URL be my web, my um, my email address. So instead of having right. Gordon at gmail.com, I wanted it Gordon at kingsportcounseling.com. So I started looking at the different ways that you could do that. And lo and behold, and it ha also had to be HIPAA secure right. uh, was the other, uh, was the other part of it. Mm -hmm. And so lo and behold is that if you get, a paid Google Workspace account, they will give you the BAA, the Business Associate Agreement, which is the big thing that you need in order to make things. I've got you. If you hear that in the background, that is my um, my Google Home that picked up my voice saying <laughs> Google. And so, oh, Google. To to yeah, that's so, <laughs> so I don't know if you want to cut that out or not, James, but, but anyway, I've got a, a Google home, you know, which is kind of like the, uh, yeah, so you're, you're, uh, you're, you're living in the future with your automated home. Yeah. So anyway, I did mean to get sidetracked there, but I kept hearing a thought who's, who's in there. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, um, so I wanted to, so with Google workspace, the, um, um, the paid version, which is only even even now, it's $6, really dollars, ten dollars a month. Yeah, they, they've gone up, so it's probably I would say around twelve dollars a month uh, okay. for for the basic, and then eighteen dollars a month for which gives you a little more storage and that kind of thing. So it's per user, and so with my group practice, I've got everybody in my Google Workspace account, and all of them have emails that say at kingsportcounseling.com. So that was really how I got started in using Google Workspace. But there's, you know, with Google Workspace, there's a whole set of add-ons that you can use. It, um, the other thing that I love about it is that it, um, it is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It is compatible with a lot of different other oh, applications. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so you can, uh, there's one application that a lot of people are using called Jot Forms, mm -hmm. which is a separate kind of third party application, but it, it integrates with Google Workspace very well. And so all of your storage can be on your Google Drive, which is, um, which is, you can make HIPAA compatible. So all of that is just, it really works well in, in kind of our context. I will say though, if you are more of an insurance based practice, um, you probably want to do kind of like what I do, which is kind of a hybrid of Google Workspace. Plus I use a, a, a platform called Therapy Notes as my, mm -hmm. and so I, the way I think about it is Therapy Notes handles the the clinical side of things, whereas Google Workspace handles the business side of things as far as the 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 management of stuff and the systems and well, processes. Well, even getting your own email address, you know, and the the HIPAA compatibility of that and all the storage, it's 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 really tough to beat that value. Yeah. It is just a great value for a little bit of money. And right. people I, I, when I was doing the uh, virtual assistant company, people, therapists didn't know, they didn't know that you needed a HIPAA compliant email, or they didn't know that Gmail, just your name at gmail.com wasn't HIPAA compliant. Mm -hmm. So having those types of the resources, it's very important when you're dealing with, um, you know, the, the data. Right, right. Great. And, and you have to, the, the one thing I will say here is that, um, the Gmail, the Gmail with Google Workspace, just right out of the box is not necessarily HIPAA secure or HIPAA compliant. Right. And not to go too far into the tech, James, but 
you have to recognize the difference between data at rest versus data in transit. And so if you're sending an email from somebody from yourself, which most email com major ones use this thing called TLS, which is uh, transport layer security encryption, mm -hmm. um, um, which is it, most of them use that. But if somebody else doesn't have that, technically that is not a secure mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So the, a lot of people will get a third party um, application uh, too that I'm um, familiar with is Virtu is one. And then there's another one called Pawbox, which provide true end-to-end -end encryption. So if somebody were to somehow or another snag the email in transit, um, a person couldn't read it. So been a lot of debate about that aspect of it on the Facebook group. Um, I've got my opinions oh, about so, that. So, so, so um, if somebody wanted to follow up on this conversation, they could ask the question in your Facebook group. What what right. was that group called again? It's just uh it's just called the Google Workspace for Therapists. Okay. Um Facebook group. Yeah, I, I belong to it. I've asked a couple of questions and and just follow it for mm -hmm. <laughs> for general information because there's people asking yeah. questions you don't think about until you see mm -hmm. it and you're like, "Oh, you know, that that's a great question." So it's a yeah. it's a great resource, a, a good good thing to belong to. Right. And that there are people that particularly a lot of people that have just cash based assist, uh, cash based practices. In other words, they're not dealing with right. third party payers like insurance that they just use that exclusively for their Google workspace for their electronic health records uh, system. Um, because, again, I like Google Calendar. Again, that's another really powerful mm -hmm. tool there. Handle all their appointments there and they you can send reminders to people and all of that kind of stuff um, through through that application. So a lot of different uses there. And the course I put together just really kind of goes through each one of the kind of applications available in Google Workspace and tells the different ways that you can use them in the context of a private practice. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's get into the main part of our mm -hmm. interview. Uh, we're you I want to hear your story of maybe you can start of where you are now, like what mm -hmm. what your where your practice is now, and then tell about some of the obstacles you faced going through. So just where are you now and where did you start and what were some of the obstacles? Yes. Well, that's a good, good, um, great question. Uh, where I am now, as I mentioned, I have a I'm the owner of Kingsport Counseling Associates in Kingsport, Tennessee, northeast corner of Tennessee. And uh, it's a small group practice. I have six uh, six other clinicians working for me. I still see clients on a limited basis. And then also we have one admin person that works part-time mm -hmm. with us here, handles the, the intakes and the phone calls and the insurance and billing and all of that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, so... That, when I first started, I really started into private practice just part-time. I was still working for the agency I'd been with and was just seeing clients on, you know, on on, in even, on evenings and weekends um, in the context of my church. But I started a, a counseling ministry at my church. And um, is that so something... Seeing, is that something they asked for? Is that something you saw the need of? Like, how did I you? I saw I saw the need of it, and also it was kind of, it kind of was a, a gateway for my kind of desire into going into into private practice full time. And at that time, I was actually thinking of um, really starting a full nonprofit, um, mm -hmm. you know, counseling center. And so I started looking into that and started you know, really kind of thinking about, okay, why would I want to do that? What, what is it that I'm looking for with that? Part of it is, is that I wanted it to be, you know, there's this idea that if something's nonprofit, it's, it's better, you know, is more, more caring or more, mm -hmm. um, well, and what's the word I'm looking more philanthropic, mm -hmm. all of that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But, you know, ultimately I just wanted to provide care to people, um, 
And I don't think that most people would care whether it's a nonprofit or not within the context of this. So made the decision to kind of go the for-profit route. Okay. Um, and so I was seeing clients within the church context. I was using some office space at the church at the time to see folks and was paying them uh, a donation, so to speak, to use the office space. And then they decided the, uh, the office building we were in, well, they decided, okay, we've got to tear this down. It's too old. So I had to go find my own office space. And I had a, um, had a, uh, at the time I was supervising somebody for licensure. I'm, okay. I'm a, I'm an LMFT, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and also an approved supervisor for that licensure track. And so I had somebody that I was supervising. And so, uh, she was seeing folks uh, in my office, you know, as part of meeting her licensure requirements for mm -hmm. clinical hours and that kind of thing. And so when I moved, she came with me. And so I kind of had we we were really kind of operating more on a what I refer to as a co-op model. We were just kind of sharing the oh, expenses of the location and that sort of thing. The costs and everything, too. Yeah, pretty much. She was. Okay. She would, I would, um, essentially what I did is came up with what, uh, what we did is we just split the cost of what it cost to rent the office, mm -hmm. um, office space at the time, which was, it was just a small office space on the second floor of a, of an insurance, insurance practice. And mm -hmm. it was, uh, you know, just had two, two, two rooms and, that's where we we started and we were just we were operating independently in other words mm -hmm. we weren't there wasn't any sort of i hadn't formed a an entity at that point with as far as the counseling office and um but then um I had somebody approach me about maybe joining in with us and so that's when i started thinking about starting yeah. a group practice and so, so you weren't necessarily looking to start a practice but you had this opportunity to mm -hmm to do it. What right. what made you decide to do a group practice? Well, um, again, there was just a need there. Mm -hmm. I was also, I was filling up. I mean, I was reaching mm -hmm. kind of the maximum number of clients that I wanted to see. And then also I was just looking at, you know, um, from a, from a profit standpoint mm -hmm. of, of being able to diversify my income, mm -hmm with what I was doing, because the, the one thing about being a solo practitioner, um, you can, you can certainly do that and be profitable and you can, you can make a good living at doing that and that sort of thing. But eventually you reach kind of this ceiling with that or glass ceiling where there's only so many clients you can see, and there's only so many hours in a day. <laughs> time, um, the, the limited yeah, resource yeah, of time and, catches and up. So, and so when you reach that point, yeah, then you've kind of kind of stifled your potential for growth with your income. Now and you, so you, you you use this phrase like trading time for dollars. Is that what right? I think you've yeah. used that with me yeah, before. Yeah, well, it's a you know, the um yeah, the one the one um the one product, but right, I'm using air quotes here, the one product that we have to offer as therapists is um, number one, our knowledge and expertise, mm -hmm. but also our time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we, that's our product is our time and our expertise. Yeah. And so in a one-to-one -one model where you're doing traditional you trade therapy. The time for dollars, which, yeah. 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 And so, um, and there's a limit to that. I mean, there's, yeah. like I said, there's only so many hours in a day and only so many clients you can take on. And, and so, emotionally too, like yes. you, I, I only did intakes, like in my therapy career, I was just listening to people's problems, writing them down. That mm -hmm. drain, that was very draining. I wasn't even doing any therapy with people. And, and I, it, it's just a draining emotional um, practice. Like yeah. and anyway, I'm just, time is one limitation, but you're like, how much can your heart handle is also a limitation. Right. So, so, yeah. so you, you were thinking, uh, there's, there's only so far I can go. I could see 30, 40 people or whatever, you know, that's a lot of people, mm -hmm. yeah. but there's a limit to that. Right. So, so right. that was one of the de determining factors for starting right. a group. 
practice. Yes, yes. And that's a, if you think about it in the context of diversifying income, um, when you're, if you're a solo practitioner and you're full, the lowest hanging fruit is to bring on somebody into mm-hmm. your practice. And, you know, if you've got two of you, you've got a group practice. And so what, <laughs> what I did is um, I just hired somebody as a contractor okay. um, and then did a fee split with them um, on that. So, um, you know, so I, I want to clarify here the, about the, because there's one, there's, uh, there's been a debate in the past about fee splitting being unethical but um, the truth of the matter is, if you work for somebody else, if you're working for an agency, they're splitting the fee with you. I mean, you're getting paid a portion of what they collect. And so same concept with fee splitting. So, you know, typically with um, group practices, it might be a 50-50 split or a 60-40 split somewhere in there. So the clinician keeps 60% of the what is collected in the and their practice owner keeps 40%. So that's kind of the model I I moved into next rather than splitting their cost of expenses, which that, you know, that adds to the bottom line um, as far as the profit that I keep, but it, it, it doesn't grow anywhere from that. And so when you add us, you start adding multiple, multiple clinicians, that's when the money starts to kind of multiply in terms of, getting getting mm-hmm. really passive income from from those people and so it's a, and it's a win-win situation because you're providing them a place to work and a place to create mm-hmm. income for themselves um and you're you know getting the benefit of that as well yeah you t- you take on the risk of mm-hmm. owning a building or all the expenses and mm-hmm. they get shielded from that and you get some of the you know, the compensation for doing that. Right. Right. So, uh, so that was one stage of growth. Um, Mm -hmm. do you have another, uh, stage where you scale? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that happened, uh, around that time when I was starting my group practice, I realized that, okay, I understand the concept, but I really don't, quite grasp all the the ins and outs and particularly the financial side of things and the business Mm -hmm. side of things Mm -hmm. of really knowing that, you know, as mental health providers or clinicians, we get worlds of great training on the clinical side of things, but (laughs) there are, there are little, uh, there is little to none uh, training on the business side of things. Sure. Yeah. So I started, I started listening to some podcasts, just there were starting, starting to be some, some podcasts that were out there, um, kind of a shout out to Melvin Varghese selling the couch. And mm-hmm. there was practice of the practice. Joe Sadox was mm-hmm. out there, that sort of thing. And I was listening to their podcasts and I was just getting a lot of information and I'm thinking, okay, I know a lot of this stuff. I mean, I learned a lot from from those podcasts, but I know a lot of this stuff. I'd like to share this as well with what I've learned. And Mm -hmm. so that's when I started the practice of the practice, Uh, mainly, I mean, excuse me, the practice of therapy, Uh, free advertising there for Joe, but um, (laughs) uh, uh, I started the practice of therapy and, and the way I went about it is I started thinking, okay, what can I call this blog? And, um, I just start started looking at domains, which was the mm-hmm. way that I kind of approached it. And lo and behold, practice of therapy.com was available. And so I snatched it up and I started the blog as a blog in 2016. And then in 2017, I thought, well, you know, I'm hearing all this stuff about podcasting being the next big thing. I'll give it a shot. You know, let me uh, <laughs> stick my toe in here. And so I bought a mic and started putting (laughs) things together and figuring out how to be a pot, how to do podcasts and produce them and all of that sort of thing. And then that boom from there, it just kind of grew. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, probably my first episodes, um, you know, I think I got 
the first episode maybe got 50 downloads or something, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> you know, just nothing there, but um, it's grown uh, since that time. I just got through recording or getting out episode number 265, I think. Oh, wow. And so, yeah. And so now the downloads are, you know, well over 5,000 a month. So it just mm. really kind of took off. And, um, you know, again, not to go too down, far down the rabbit hole, but, um, you know, the stages of growth were moving really from the one-to-one Mm-hmm. way of doing business and creating income to going to the one from one to one to the one to many. Mm-hmm. And so with, with podcasting, there's a lot of opportunity to, to um, monetize the podcast and then also um, create other sidelines that are with that. So I created, you know, as I mentioned, the Google workspace for therapist course mm-hmm. and the now I've got, you know, the money matters course. And then I've got a uh, course that I collaborated with David Hall that yep. you all have heard on this, this podcast on um, uh, starting a group practice. And so mm-hmm. a lot of different avenues there for, for teaching and sharing information and that kind of thing. And all of that can be monetized in a way that um, feel, feels good for, for most of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the um, some podcasting, you do some affiliate marketing where Mm -hmm. you talk about somebody else's product. And if they buy it, you get a piece. If they don't buy it, it's not, you know, nothing happens. But when you have an audience, there's there's ways to reach out to people. And I think, you know, you're creating the um, SciCraft Network with the community of people that are Mm kind of like similar interests, talking about the same things, Mm -hmm. like willing to help each other like the community is a really good community i mean i'm a part of it so you know take that mm-hmm. for what it's worth but there yeah. there's been a lot of generous people in the sidecraft network you know helping each other promoting each other and that just just is a uh oh another way to grow your audience and increase your impact which also increases your income so yeah it it yeah so you're you're branching out a little bit and you seem to be sort of the I'm going to try it and see if it works kind of person mm-hmm. is that sort of like one of the yeah that that would be that, that, that you would have be true I mean it's kind of like uh uh one of one of the lines I use a lot is I'm going to build the airplane as I fly it and so <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't sound it sounds kind of risky but uh yeah but that's uh, that's how we learn anything I think we we have to be willing to make mistakes and, mm. and learn from our mistakes. Um, but I think it, it's putting things into action is the big thing. And I'm, the other thing I would say about any of this stuff, whether it's going into private practice, starting a podcast or doing creating courses or mm-hmm. any of that, is you have to be, as I like to say, persistent and consistent with what you do. You have to just kind of keep at it. And I think, um, you know, over time with with persistency and consistency, things will grow. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then also being able to listen to others. I mean, being able to um, kind of validate from your audience or from people that are involved. OK, is this a good idea or not? Is this something that resonates with you or or not? And so being able to think about things in that way. Yeah, that mindset is is really critical. Can you imagine if you had like a a, a negative mindset when you just got fifty downloads or something? Mm-hmm. Like, you'd be ready to quit. Like, right? Like, like that's that's like, oh, I put all this work into it. I bought this fancy microphone, you know, mm-hmm. and now and now nothing happened. I mean, could you imagine? So let's let one of the questions I wanted to ask you kind of relates to this. What what do you wish you knew? What do you wish you knew now or back then? What do you wish you knew when you were started? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things, well, there's lots of things I wish I had (laughs) known, but um, yeah, but I think as much as anything, I think um, being able to get away from kind of an imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. uh, to some degree Mm -hmm. um, of being able to have a little more, self, you know, confidence in what I'm doing in that, um, really it's about, 
It's really about connecting with people, which, you know, for those of us in the mental health field, that's yeah. what we do is we connect with people. And so being able to, to really have more confidence in, in my ability to do that. And I think too, um, the other thing too, is that I think a lot of times people have this idea that, well, somebody else is doing that. I did, it's not an original idea. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like, well, there's, there's several other podcasts on this, on this topic. I don't, you know, why, why stick my toe in the water? And the thing that I wish I knew back then, uh, is that whatever your voice is, that's going to resonate with people in a unique way. And so what I do um, resonates with some folks, whereas what somebody else does might mm -hmm. resonate with them more. And so, um, but the yeah. other thing too is, is that there's plenty, there's plenty to go around. And uh, a that, generous, um, a generous mindset. Yes. Yes. And so um, being able to also being able to collaborate more. Mm -hmm. One other thing I will mention too, James, that I wish I had known known back then mm -hmm. was not to try to bootstrap so much of learning to okay now yeah. I feel like you're I feel like you're trying to tell me something here Gordon I feel yeah. like yeah <laughs> I, I, I'm connecting with what you're saying so yeah put it on yeah. lay it on me what's that advice yeah, yeah so no but I think I think in you know in the beginning stages of any kind of venture I think it's good to bootstrap because you're teaching yourself kind of the mm -hmm. back end. You're of You're learning some good lessons. Yep. You're learning some good lessons. You understand how it works, that sort of thing. But I think one of the things, um, you know, I think about, you know, with, with therapists, one of the things, particularly with a lot of solo practitioners, make this mistake of trying to answer the phone calls, set appointments with people, oh, doing yeah. all of this stuff. Call the, the back insurance end company stuff. back. Yeah, all of those yeah, things. Yeah. Do the social media. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is not a good use of their time. And so being able to let go of that and recognize that when you let go of those things and you actually hire hire somebody else to do some of those things, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, getting rid of those red card things and yes. handing them off to somebody yeah. else is a good return on your investment. And it will probably pay for itself in the long run. Yeah. I'm not talking because I'm thinking. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, I'm like, yeah. maybe I need to redo this exercise again for myself. Cause I find yeah. myself, you know, you know my story, but I uh, -huh. uh six months ago, the company I used to work for got sold mm -hmm. and the position was eliminated, you know. So so now I'm trying to, I thought, like, what do I do well? I do tech well. I I do um, like information sharing. I help people. What could I help people with? I'll create this course business, but I'm I'm bootstrapping it. You know, you know, I don't mm -hmm. have a ton of savings, so I am bootstrapping. You know, the course creation and some of the social media and the blog, like all the all the little things. What I like to do is connect with people, interview people, do marketing, and maybe mm -hmm. do some teaching. So what are the, like the 50 other things that aren't marketing, teaching and like tech right. that I need yeah. to write some red cards down and maybe not tomorrow, but mm -hmm. at some point in my future, find ways to delegate those things that really drain me or that I'm mm -hmm. putting off or that I'm right. not answering the calls. Uh, yeah. that, that is, um, yeah. you know, really, really great advice. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the other thing I'll say real quickly about bootstrapping is, um, you know, as you're learning stuff, it's a good idea to start documenting kind of your steps and your systems and processes mm -hmm. for doing those things that you're learning, because uh, eventually you will want to hand those off. Um, and so if you document them along the way, you've already got your kind of your uh, user manual already created, so to speak, so that you can quickly Wonderful. teach yeah. teach somebody else what to do. Yeah, when I was doing the um, the virtual assistant company, we had a uh, we used Loom. Mm -hmm. it's, that's a video program. I'm sure there's other ones out there, but we used Loom and like a spreadsheet. And if you did something, you recorded it. <laughs> and uh, I did it a lot for my manager. You know, res uh, responsibilities. 
you just recorded it and and put if you had steps you wrote it out and then it was there for the next person mm -hmm. and when you're yeah. doing something that is very you know process oriented with a beginning and an end just document the process eventually when it's mm -hmm. time to let it go you're going to have that and it's going to be much easier for the person to pick it up and if sure. they find a mistake this was from um run like clockwork uh, i took mm -hmm. a course from them if you find a mistake or they find a better way to do it. Now it's their responsibility to record the next video for the yes. next person. Like you don't uh -huh. have to rewrite it. Just mm -hmm. give that away to everyone. And that uh, that is a, a great, another great gem of a tip. Sure. Uh, we're, we're uh, Gordon, we could talk for another hour, but we're yeah, heading. I'm in, sure we could. <laughs> we're heading into the end. Like I have two questions, two questions left. Uh, you you, maybe you can combine them. One is how do you use your story now to help your 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 clients? And uh, two is what are solutions you're offering now to help your customers scale? So maybe you can kind of smash that into one question. But uh, what's your story and how are you helping people now? You know, is yeah. might be a good question for you. Yeah. So what one one of the things that I I learned along the way again, and this is kind of goes back to the other question, is not to do too much of it all, alone. I think you need to mm. have mentors, and you need to mm -hmm. have a community of people around you that can support you along the way, and and also people you can bounce ideas off of. I think one of the most important things I think is a for, and I would say this is true of any business owner, is to have a group of trusted colleagues that you can mm. in some ways confide in and be able to share ideas and learn from them and they can learn from you and that sort of thing um, is, is something that I think is just invaluable. And every time I've gotten involved with like something like a mastermind group or focus groups, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, it is actually projected me far forward faster by doing those things and awesome. and having people that you can be accountable to through all of that. And so, yeah. So yeah, that, that was, doesn't always change you, but support and accountability does. Right. And so that was really, um, you know, part of my um, kind of my impetus, I guess that's the correct word of um, starting the Sitecraft network of which James is a part of of really just being able to share ideas, cross promote, being able to um, learn from each other uh, in the context of a community. Mm. Uh, because I think one of the things that we learned from COVID, if nothing else, is that community is important and that to be isolated too long is just detrimental to us all Fair, yeah. emotionally, physically, spiritually, all of that kind of thing. Yeah. So rolling that to the business context, being isolated without a group of support, accountability, and trust, it is you're you're not going to grow as fast or be as strong um, by your by yourself. Somebody mm -hmm. somebody wants um. I wish I remembered the 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 book or the podcast. They 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 uh, their example was like a wolf pack, like a mm -hmm. lone wolf gets can get attacked by other wolves or whatever but a wolf pack achieves more together like it's mm -hmm. like you know who is your pack i guess was the was right. the, was their right. their their story because you can do more together uh with a group that supports you right and as human beings we're social creatures anyway mm -hmm. whether whether you're an introvert or an extrovert we need others great well that's a good place to to end a little bit um where can people, before I ask the one thing that you want people to know uh, or remember, where can people find you and what is something you're offering? Yes. Yeah, so they can come to just my website, practiceatherapy.com. And I've got tons of great resources on there of to really kind of build it, continue to build that out. I do, if somebody's in those beginning stages of uh, going into private practice, I've got a private practice startup guide. You'll see mm -hmm. plenty of links there on the page. And um, yeah, if you go to my resources tab um, or button there, you can get see all the th different things that I offer and uh, the things that are available for, for people. And then you can always reach out to me, email me at gordon at practiceoftherapy.com. 
And what's your, uh, do you know off the top of your head, if they sign up for your newsletter, what's the freebie that they get? Yes, they get the, get the well, it depends on which way they do which it. Which freebie? Lot, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's lots of different ways to do that, depending on your interest. Like I've got several kind of PDF downloads. Like I've got a, a Google a Google Workspace hacks sheet okay. that they can get. Cool. Um, I, I would say here here would be a good thing for people to do the a free talk about a freebie. I've got several free webinars that are automated mm -hmm. and they can just simply go to practiceoftherapy.com slash webinars and so you got some free there, training right up free training the, in there. Practice of uh, therapy cool. slash webinars. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what's the one thing that you want people to remember from this episode? Oh, wow. I would say um, being being willing to, to some degree, take a risk, mm. be willing to build the airplane as you fly it. Um, and I would say be persistent and consistent with what you do and um, and do it in small steps. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to do the huge, big things, but the small steps add up over time um, and get kind of going back to my, the, the podcasting thing. My, my job, when I started that podcast was, I told myself, I'm just going to get it out every week mm -hmm. and um, do what I need to do to do that. And that was my only goal with it is to get it out consistently. Great. Well, that, that, that's those four or five things sound like a uh, mm -hmm. start of a good book, Gordon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the chapters of a book. So my one thing would be uh, be willing to give things away, like be mm -hmm. willing to maximize your strengths and give things away highlighted by some of the advice that you had given in this, like, uh, uh, and write, write stuff down, start documenting what you do. And someday you're going to give some of that away. So that, that was mm -hmm. awesome advice. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going to end the show. Thanks Gordon for joining me. It's been great. I've enjoyed being and enjoyed our conversation. So this is James Marland with Gordon Brewer. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Psych Maven is proud to support the Scaling Therapy Practice Podcast. And if you are someone looking for ideas that are tailored to your own personal style on how to scale and grow your own impact and income as a mental health provider, we hope you might check out our free online assessment. If you go to stp.psychmaven.com, you can take our free personal inventory and find out what your builder type is as a helping professional. This assessment is quick and fun, and it comes with tons of customized resources with your results, so you can discover the best ways to scale that match your own personality. Find the assessment at stp.psychmaven.com. That is stp.psychmaven.com. P-S-Y-C-H-M-A-V-E-N dot com. Have fun with it. Thank you for listening to the Scaling Therapy Practice. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to remind you that the content shared today is for general information and entertainment purposes only. It shouldn't be considered as legal or tax advice. If you need a professional advice in those areas, please consult with a licensed attorney or accountant. But thank you so much for listening. The Scaling Therapy Practice is part of the SciCraft Network.